Good evening and welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody, you might as well buy them from us. Help fund the movement, help support the movement. We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I am your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota, for episode 134. Today we have another incredible, incredible family and friends guest episode, uh, none other than Cash Patel, um, the pipe hitter. Cash Patel, former chief of staff to the Secretary of Defense during the Trump administration and also deputy director of national intelligence when it comes to intelligence and the intelligence community the relationship of the intelligence community and military as it pertains to President Donald Trump and a lot of the, um, let's say, uh, collusion that went on to try and undermine Donald Trump's presidency and all the great work that he had done all around the world to help put our, our nation in a better position. Cash Patel is the man to, to, to listen to. So we're happy to have Cash Patel on. We hope you enjoy the interview. Um, I look forward to talking to you when we're done. Without Further ado, the great Cash Patel. The great Cash Patel, welcome to Please Call Me Crazy. It's an honor to have you here. Um, our, our good, our good comrade Steve Bannon has been telling me I got to get Cash Patel on the podcast. You're you're a person of interest. You've been killing it over there on War Room. We we really appreciate your work. Um, I usually spend a little bit of time, and, and you know what we'll do? We'll reschedule another one so we can get the Cash Patel backstory. But I don't think there's anything more important that we could talk about right now than a little bit of your time um, dealing with the intelligence community uh, and and your position as the chief of staff for the SEC DEF uh, mm-hmm. under the Trump administration. I don't know what things you can and can't speak to based on legal matters or whatever the case may be, but I want to talk more generally, right? Like. Yeah. For example, I, I can't overstate the people, and there's still these people out there that don't believe in in this far right wing conspiracy theory of of uh, you know government collusion and and all of these intelligence communities that have uh, motives or agendas that are incompetent, least least to say uh, malicious or or uh, corrupt. Mm-hmm. Um, to, let's start off right here. Talk to me about the intelligence community and the fifty one intelligence community officers that signed this Russian collusion hoax deal mm. that got streamlined to the mainstream uh, media uh, and, and was paraded around as proof that Donald Trump and his administration were, were involved in some type of, uh, you know, corruption there in, in 2016. Now, Royce, it's great to be with you. And um, I, I also been talking to Bannon a lot. He's like, you got to get on that guy's show. I'm like, all right, all right, I got to do it. But you and I got to find better friends than Bannon. We got to We got to get better company. Uh, no, no doubt. Uh, no doubt. It's 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 it's, it's and, and I'm glad we're skipping the bio because that's the stuff that puts people to sleep. But look, so, yeah, my wheelhouse to national security in a variety of roles, you know, and the one that sort of hits this chord about the 51 Intel letter are two places for me. One, when I was chief uh, investigator for the Russiagate scandal way back in the House Intel days with Devin Nunes. <clears throat> And I'll tell you why that's important in a second. And two, when I was deputy director of national intelligence um, under Donald Trump, overseeing the entire intelligence community. So what you have here is you literally got the criminal in the case, Hunter Biden, providing you with essentially a videotape of the bank robbery and the guy's not wearing a ski mask. And as a former national security prosecutor and public defender who's done a lot of courtroom work, I mean, that's the best kind of evidence. It's like, what are you going to say? That's that's not my face. You know, like it's a it's a tough sell to the jury. And when you have such good evidence like that, intelligence, whatever you want to say, the left is going to come in like they did during Russiagate and say, you guys are lying. That's their knee jerk reaction. When I found out that the FBI and DOJ lied to a federal court, the media came in and said, no, you're lying. And I'm like, but it's it's their document. I didn't write it. It's their videotape. And of course, that took years and years and years to overturn. Right. And what did they call it, though, the whole time? They called, we were doing Russian disinformation. We were the ones putting out Russian disinformation because we dared to call out the DOJ and FBI for illegally surveilling Donald Trump and his campaign, which we all now know it's is true. exactly what happened. 
Exactly. So the Hunter Biden let, uh, laptop letter, the 51 Intel letters we now call it, is like Russiagate, you know, 2.0, 3.0, whatever version you want to talk, whatever you want to call it. So when you have 51 people, two directors of the Central Intelligence Agency, one director of the National Security Administration, one deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency, and two former secretaries of defense sign this letter at the behest of Joe Biden's current Secretary of State, Tony Blinken. He was a senior campaign surrogate for Biden five days before the election, goes to these guys and says, hey, we need a letter. We, we might not win this factually, obviously, so we need you guys to come in and call it Russian disinformation. Mm. And they get 51 people to drop this letter, I think it was four or five days before the presidential election, and the same thing happened. They rigged another presidential election. And now it's, of course, it's been proven dispositively that the laptop is not Russian disinformation. The FBI and DOJ who had the laptop for a year plus knew that to be the case and allowed this letter to come out anyway because they didn't want Donald Trump to win. It's the same crew of government gangsters from back in Russiagate that is involved in signing this letter, that is involved right now in the Biden corruption scandal, whether it's classified documents case or the disaster overseas or on our southern border. These people all work in unison. It's not a Democrat or Republican thing. But the, the biggest problem is, you know, yeah, I, of course, want Republicans in power. But the biggest problem to me is you're robbing us of our elections. You're, you are stealing them from us. Most basically, you're ro you're, you're robbing the, us of the democratic process altogether, right? It's like they're, they're, you can't go in the mainstream media or on this cultural uh, world tour talking about the, the danger of democracy or the danger to democracy that Donald Trump and the, the far right American nationalist populist pose, the war room posse, the war room show, the cash patels of the world. These people are a threat to democracy, but you're completely okay <laughs> with rigging elections. It's crazy. And I meet yeah. people all the time. I saw because I, you know, I wrote Trump one on the side of my head during this big three game, and uh, and people called me and said, "You're election denier. You're a danger to democracy." And I go, "Wait a minute. There's a process way before the election results, and and the people who undermine the actual electoral process fundamentally, like if the election is rigged through this, or or maybe it's ballots, or maybe it's the machine, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the you people are actually election deniers of a different sort, right?" Um, but before we go a little bit further, please just give me a brief or give the fans a brief synopsis of the kind of work you would do uh, as much as you can as a deputy, um, uh, deputy director, of national intelligence. Cause I think people here, you know, we just jump right into it and they're like, cash Patel, how does it do have all this guy was as high up the trough with classified and, and yeah. government secret intelligence information as you possibly could be. But give us a little bit more about what, what that, that job entails. Yeah, so we have 17 agencies and departments responsible for intelligence. Most people know the CIA, the NSA, right? The human human guys going around the world collecting intel, creating assets. The NSA are the signals guys, they're in the satellites and the computers and all that stuff. But there's a whole host of other agencies that support that mission set. You know, there's actually like an agency that just does like mapping. There's an agency that just does satellite work. And so you bring it all together in one place. And after 9-11 happened, the 9-11 Commission said the reason that we didn't prevent 9-11 was not because we didn't know about bin Laden, but because the CIA and the FBI and other agencies failed to share the information they had nested within their particular stovepipe. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, they just weren't saying, hey, we know this guy's in San Diego. He's connected to bin Laden. Oh, FBI's got a case open on him and CIA knows about this stuff. Why aren't we talking? So the DNI, the, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, was created to sit on top of this behemoth and say, OK, everything comes up so that we at the DNI's office put all the intel in one place and we do one thing. We do the presidential daily briefing. It's the most classified packet that we give out on a daily basis and walk into the Oval Office twice a week and brief the president and the cabinet secretaries on. You know, what are your priorities? Iran, Russia, China, the border, the cartels, whatever, right? And that changes over time. So when I was deputy director of national intelligence, we oversaw that mission set of making sure the agencies and departments talk to each other, making sure the presidential daily brief, which in my opinion is the most important thing you can give to your government, because they are going to make decisions based on that information is accurate. But also more importantly, 
what I learned from going back to my Russiagate days is that the government used this classified process to just cover up their corruption. Mm. So we went in there and unwound it. You know, we, I'll give you an example. Michael Flynn, you can like him or hate him. I didn't care. I found the evidence of Michael Flynn's innocence had been classified and not provided to him while he was being prosecuted. Right. So I called FBI and DOJ and said, we're releasing this. And they go, Chris Ray was like, no, you're not. And I go, here's how this works. You don't work for me. Uh, I don't work for you. You work for me. I own this intel. It's going out the door. And we all know what happened in that case, right? Michael Flynn was basically exonerated right. after three years of, 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 of just hell. And so that's part of the job we did. We, we, we uh, unredacted all the text messages between the lovers you know, Strzok and Lisa Page. And that's how you got all that information out about how their bias was when they were running the investigation. So I wish that uh, process continued, but obviously Biden shut it down. But those are the major responsibilities of that of that kind of role. So, and my, my question here, um, and, and you can tell me if I'm way off base, Please, get, let, let's go back to Russia, because, you know, Russia is a, a common theme in, in, in your history there in D.C. and as a part of the intelligence community. I want to talk about the intelligence community a little bit more thoroughly as we go on, but I want to get this Russia thing out there on the table early because it, it's just wild to me. It's wild to me to see the double and triple and quadruple down on the conflict there with Russia, mm -hmm. although I understand the history, and I want to see if I have my history right. I want to... I want to you know, test my history with somebody who, who is well informed. <laughs> Can't get a better guy than me. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, now we're seeing the, the, the news pop up. You know, when they go on MSNBC and say, we have to redefine success in the Ukraine, that's them saying we were wrong, we lost, okay? Right. People don't may not see it that way, but, but that's effectively what they're saying. To tell me if I have this right. To me, I see that Great Britain and, and the European Union, or Great Britain, the British Empire has been at war with Russia for a couple hundred years. It's well-documented, academic uh, document of what they call the great game between Great Britain and Russia, which I, I say on my podcast hit a real inflection point after Mackinder released the World Island Theory, and there was this you know, there was this geopolitical throwdown or, or jousting for position for the heartland because everybody thought the heartland was going to be the springboard to world island dominance. And we're playing that theater out now. We're still playing that theater out now. But but more recently that this this uh, animus towards Russia post World War Two and the start of the Cold War. And even with the with the economic politics, like with, with people like Kissinger and Brzezinski, right, Mika's dad, the 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 late uh, 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 Zig Benyu Brzezinski, these people were very, very anti-Russian. And you see this sort of Atlanticist, post-World War II democratic liberal order that will not concede this Russia beef. I mean, they're just obsessed with it. What's, what's your, do I have my history right? Is that kind of the the, the political track of, of why we're in the, invested in this, this you know, gridlock throwdown with, with a country that we seem to have some uh, amenable relations with under Donald Trump. I mean, there's some type yeah. of desire to have a, a, a working relationship there. Or are we getting conned by the Russians and are they just secretly posing as capitalists and Catholics and they're really <laughs> communists still? I don't know. You're the intelligence guy. I'm uh, just. No, uh, yeah. Uh, no, the history spot on. I think the problem is when, you know, going back when the Soviet, you know, when the wall fell and the empire fell and then we went over to Russia and, you know, supposedly that was a time period where we were going to make the deal where it all stopped, you know, communism wasn't gonna grow, the West wasn't gonna interfere in their governance internally inside of Russia. And I think the one thing you have to remind people is the deal they made, the deal NATO made with Russia from a Russian standpoint was we will not expand the empire that is the Western alliance along your border. We will not expand NATO countries. We will not include more and more and more NATO countries mm -hmm. um, if you, Russia, the Soviet Union, agree to stop interfering with, you know, democracy. Right. If you fast forward that, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying the West has been breaking that agreement for 25 years, literally. So if you're right. Vladimir Putin, people are like, why did you go into Russia? Uh, excuse me, why did you go into the Ukraine? It's not rocket science. The guy was told by the leaders of Great Britain, America, the Western Span uh, uh, European nations and others, they were promised by our leaders, we will not add to NATO. 
And every decade, we added a country to NATO. Every decade, we added a country to NATO. And Putin's sitting there going, WTF, you're literally violating this international agreement. Of course, I'm going to go invade the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying that's never a good justification for war. But right. from his perspective, and from the Russian people's perspective, they're thinking, wait a second, we got, we got conned. We had an agreement. We abided by it. You keep adding NATO. Now they're talking about Sweden going in and more countries going in. So there's no impetus for him to withdraw. But when you have a feckless commander in chief like we do now in Joe Biden versus a powerful one in Donald Trump, at least the two of them talked. And at least they didn't start world wars. They weren't best of friends. And that's not the point. Russia is never not going to be communist. And the United States of America is never not going to be a constitutional republic. It's just, it ain't changing. Right. But what you can do is take your allies that Russia depends upon for oil, for gas, for energy, where they export that material to bankroll their economy and hinder them, shut them down. Look, we shut down Nord Stream 2. There was a reason we shut that pipeline down because the Russians were gonna provide all the gas and energy to Germany at a fraction of the cost while stealing intelligence back during that process. And from, now the, German, happens, right? from the Germans or from the West in general? From the West in general, but the pipeline was into Germany. So it was like a direct, it was like connecting like two superpowers and saying, here, go. Right. Like an internet connection, essentially. And then being like, we're just going to suck everything up. We shut it down. No surprise. Joe Biden reverses it. And then what happens? The pipeline explodes. Uh, you know, like. That's Joe Biden. That's Joe Biden saying Trump had it right. But we, we yeah. you know, now we can't we can't say it. And, and then we can't say that we blew it up either. I mean, it's the entire Biden administration is a, is a complete testament of Donald Trump's competence. And you got the, his administration's <laughs> competence. They won't say it. But people yeah. are starting to see it. And the, the polls reflect that. So but continue, please. No, no. And, that, and so when you talk about Russia, the where they win is where the CCP wins is where Iran wins. It's propaganda. And because it doesn't cost them a lot of money, what did they interfere with our elections? And we caught them and it cost them 44, literally $44,000 to interfere in the whole Russiagate, uh, Hillary Clinton, all that deal. And we're still talking about it to this day. They won on that propaganda game. Mm. They're going into the Ukraine. They're not going throughout the Ukraine. I know people that are going to Kiev and partying like it's Miami, um, going out in nightclubs. And I'm not saying that pieces of the Ukraine aren't, you know, crumbling, right. but the whole country's not. And what they're doing is they're putting up the photos just like they're doing in Israel, in Gaza, and they're putting up the propaganda photos, the slaughtering of children, the crumbling of buildings, the right. explosions, the hospital attacks, and they're winning the propaganda campaign. Right. And all we're doing is trying to deflect and say, oh, we need a, a stoppage. We need a two week ceasefire, a ceasefire. That's not how you win wars. And then Joe Biden sitting here giving them $6 billion for hostages. Now he's saying he's going to turn over $10 billion for hostages. And the reason it all goes back to Russia is because Iran is completely bankrolled by the Russians and the CCP. It's all interrelated. And right now they're having a dance party at the expense of the United States of America because we, we won't do anything to counter it. I'm going to say something. Well, I, I agree with you completely, but I'm going to say something that many would view as extreme, uh, and I want to know your thinking on it. My my theory of the case is we are way too confounded in all of these places. I think the the baseline premise of America First policy is deeply rooted in foreign policy and, and trying to come away from this dogma of interventionism, right? And that was the hallmark of Kissinger policy and Brzezinski policy and all of the neocon, neoliberal orders. We have to be everywhere at all times intervening. We have to stop these things, these threats to, to democracy, these threats to our national interests. They're where they, where they are before they can make landfall on us, which is kind of a lie in the first place. They really are saying we want to prop ourselves up everywhere else. And then we don't even have to, we'll just reap the benefits. Um, but even with, uh, even with Israel, for example, and, and I know this is a this is a hot button, but I said on day one is that these people are very aware of the narrative. They're very aware of the propaganda. They're very aware of of how to use the media to their advantage. That has to be something you consider if you're going to fight a war against them. To 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 act like that's not a piece of it is a it's negligent. It's it's negligent. It's incompetent. It's 
it, it starts to make you think that the people who say they're fighting for you are in on the scam because it's so obvious. Mm -hmm. And so my, my question when it comes to interventionism and foreign policy in general, headed into Trump's second term, which, I, which it looks like we're, we're sure to get, uh, I know the, the Vegas odds have been, been this way before, and, uh, and, and we've seen uh, miracles in the wee hours of the night uh, for, for Joe Biden. But it's part of a strategy for us going forward that we need to become, may, maybe it's that we don't need to have a relationship with the Russians or the CCP. Or, or any of these people. Maybe we need to come back home, bring our boys home, hunker down, you know, be be um, be there in intelligence insofar as we we reasonably can. But you see, even this deal with Russia, like I just said, and I'm kind of going back on what I said. You know, we seem to be able to have some type of relationship with Russia, which was a good thing. It was overblown and seemed like you know Trump is under the the the, the thumb of Putin. I did, I never believed that for a second from the outside looking in, but um, maybe it is we don't need to have any content. I mean, why why are we so open to being in business in any sense if it's a moral issue, if it's a principal issue? Like even in the conservative movement, if the Russians and the CCP and the Iranians wanna, you know, wanna circle jerk each other in some anti-Western alliance, why are we doing business with any of them? Why, do we, why don't we cut the CCP off completely? Why don't we cut Russia off completely and, and to me, it seems like it's in the interest of the Europeans. And we need to have a serious discussion about our Atlanticist mentality and how much we're willing to sacrifice for the Europeans. What's your feeling about, about that lay of the land there? Look, you're not, you're not off basis here. And in, in terms of relationship, like people take that term colloquial and be like, oh, if you have a relationship with them, you're on great terms. No, right. you got to rewind the clock back and define your relationship. Trump had a relationship with the fat man in DPRK. In North Korea, he went over there for a reason. Trump had a relationship with Xi Jinping. Trump had a relationship with Vladimir Putin and, and Modi and all these other folks around the world. He had that to build a global relationship to say, hey, you are done launching rockets over our friends in Japan. I'm going to come see you and you're going to shut that down. You're also going to send home the remains of over 200 soldiers from the Korean War, mm. American soldiers, which he did. You're also going to release Otto Warmbier. And another hostage, we got out of North Korea custody because Trump had a relationship, which wasn't a bad relationship, but it was the one that he needed to have the impact for putting America first. The same thing with Xi Jinping. He told him flat out. He said, look, if you're going to manipulate the currency, then I'm going to exponentially tariff you to the moon. Yes. And he did. And then comes along TikTok and we shut it down. And people went nuts and the kids and the lefties went, you know, lost their minds and said, how dare you? TikTok is the digital fentanyl for the CCP. It's just as bad, in my opinion, as putting that stuff in your arm or however you're supposed to take it and killing our youth. And Trump went in there and tariffed them to no end. He also issued sanctions to Russian oligarch. It's a, it's a piecemeal system yeah. that he connected together to say the CCP, the DPRK, the Russians, the Iranians, we're gonna, we are going to cut off Iran from the global banking system, period. But not just us, all of our allies. If you do business with Iran, we're going to cut you off. These are the relationships Trump was building publicly. He would tell Putin that. He would tell Xi Jinping that. And they would say, wait a second, we kind of need the Americans, not necessarily for all of our business, but if they're telling every other country not to do business with us and making it a penalty if they do, we got to walk that back. Right. That's a good relationship. Yes. That's a relationship in which they at least respected us and we at least prevented at the end game for me from national security guy, Iran cannot have a nuclear weapon. Like that's where it kind of like, that's the end point. You got to like work it back and they can't have any of our hostages and they can't be helped by Russia and they can't be helped by the CCP and the CCP can't grow in the South China Sea and maybe launch a war against Taiwan, right? Their version of the Ukraine right. um, and like Gaza for the Israelis. And so what Trump did was define these relationships through not just national security measures, but economic measures, uh, State Department sanctions, treasury sanctions, banking sanctions. And we would just block and tackle till these folks got, look, they were never gonna get in line, but we wanted them to stop making threats of war, stop taking American citizens, stop killing our allies. And I think for the large part, they listened. They didn't like it, but they listened. And the yeah. media just 
hated Donald Trump's successes, in my opinion, which is why they just excoriated him at every turn because he was so successful. I was like, what do you guys hate? You guys hate being secure? You hate a good economy? You hate not getting drugs from China? I mean, like, what, what do you hate? You, you hate that rockets aren't being fired at our allies? Like, you, you don't like the fact that we're winding out of wars? I mean, they just couldn't stand that Donald Trump was the one that delivered for them. Well, and, you know, the, the contradiction from the left is, is a, a great barometer of, of our uh, society and our culture here in America writ large. I, I've said in this, this recent conflict there with Israel and, 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 and in Gaza, um, you know, all of these people are pro-Muslim, you know, they're, they're, they're supporting Palestine, they want to go out in the streets and say free Palestine, but they're completely okay with President Xi <laughs> making landfall in San Francisco and getting paraded around as some modern political hero. And and he's put two million Uyghurs uh, conservatively yeah. in concentration mm-hmm. camps, and 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 but you're but you're 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 against the West uh, being racist towards Muslims or Arabs. <laughs> G- give me a break. I'm not I'm not buying it from them. Yeah. And, and but but I also will say, I don't like to define myself by my enemies' worldviews. I think that's a pitfall of of our movement right now is that we get caught up in defining ourselves by our enemies. And when they have such an absurd starting place, to even get caught up with them is a sort of uh, uh, undermining of the integrity of our position. I see that often where we have this knee jerk or or quick reaction to, to what the left is doing or saying, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a place where you've lost your footing in, in what's moral and what's ethical. And and so let, let, let's break these three issues apart. We got the South China Sea Theater, it's coming fast and, and furious, or at least it appears that way. You got the Middle East Theater, you got the Russia, you know, European Theater, all very different theaters. Um, and and I, I'll say this to start, and, and you mentioned the Iran thing and Iran getting a nuclear weapon. Another thing I said in the first week of this Israel deal is, I don't buy that all of these Muslim and Arab leaders are as aligned as we, as we like to say here in the West. Now you can turn on Fox News and hear them go on and on about the Muslim Brotherhood, and I know them very well. I live here in Minneapolis. Obviously, they have a heavy presence here, and I'm not afraid of these people, and they know I'm not afraid of them. Uh, I know a lot of conservatives are, and it's, it's not a nothing issue, but it, Islam has the same sort of fractionation in their part of the world and the same sellout mentality that we have here in the West, but, but yet we all, you know, it was the Muslims are coming, the Muslims are coming, and the Iranians are going to get a nuke. Is it Here's my thing. I made a joke. Maybe this is inappropriate. A lot of Muslims wouldn't like this, but I don't really care. I'm the hatchet man. I just have this vision of the Ayatollah taking his turban off at night, wherever he is, and he's got like a white girlfriend or three or four white <laughs> girlfriends, and you know he's eating Chick Fil A and he's watching Johnny Carson reruns, and he's completely Westernized. And I say that as a joke, but I mean what I mean to say is, how do we know this guy's not on the payroll? It just seems that every once in a while, there's a leftist American elite or a neocon elite that has some workaround deal to send money to these people to pose this ominous threat to Israel or the Middle East, and it ends up justifying why we have to be everywhere at all times defending the empire. Let's start with the Middle East theater. Are these Arabs really as aligned as we think, or are they suffering from the same sort of sellout fragmentation that we are here in the West? And if they are suffering from that, is it prudent for us to spend so much resource and so much time defending uh, our allies in the Middle East from from this would be threat. Yeah, look, if you wind back the clock to the Trump administration with the Middle East, when you're talking the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Qataris, the Bahrainis, etc., and let's remind the audience, people just always forget this. There was a Middle East peace accord that didn't happen overnight. People tried to get that done for decades. And the media tried to belittle it again because Donald Trump and Jared Kushner succeeded on that front. Well, To me, the heart of the answer to your questions are in that analysis. We had countries who are not predominantly, they are Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we know there used to be a heavy Al Qaeda presence in some of those countries that led to bin Laden, that led to 9-11, that led to all this nasty, terrible stuff. And it's still around to this day. It's still in the ethos of the American mindset. And you can't blame people for that. But at the same time, we had to make the bigger call of saying, 
okay, we need peace out there. We need stability. We don't want war. And we want these folks to come in for us against Iran because they rely heavily on the Saudis, the Emiratis, and et cetera, to help them with their currency. Because listen, Iran doesn't have a banking system, so they got to fly right. cash in. They need, and there's a lot of innocent Iranians. I'm the first one to say that. These people living in Iran, most of them don't want the Ayatollah there. Most of them want like a version of a democratic government or the like. And they're suffering more than most in the world because the Ayatollah and his folks and the IRGC and the Quds Force and the military are in power. The element that's in power is a radicalized version of, of you know, the Islam faith that you're talking about. Right. And we see it here in America, but yeah, they see it in their countries. They know it exists there. They're fighting that fight just as much as we are fighting it from here. Um, and we just are doing it on different fronts. And when it comes to Iran, which I think is a central sort of note of this whole thing, look at where we are now. Trump had the peace accords, moved the embassy to Jerusalem, had Israel on the verge of signing a peace deal with the Saudis, of all people, right? And then le we left office and Joe Biden said, whatever, we're not doing that stuff. Right. Um, and look where we are now, another world war. And people are like, well, how dare you guys talk to them? Well, of course we're talking to them because look what we're doing, look at what they're doing under Biden. The Saudis, the Emiratis and, and other countries out there are assisting the Iranian government right now. The Iranian government is in bed with the Russians and the CCP. Don't take my word for it. MBS, the leader of Saudi Arabia, won't even take Joe Biden's phone call. He left Secretary of State Blinken on the runway for two hours and then punked him and didn't even show up. Yeah. That's what they think of the United States of America. That's how they think of the diplomatic engagements our leadership is going after them with because they're saying, you are no longer a factor in how we consider our foreign policy. Right. You, the United States of America, are an afterthought. If we want to help Iran, we will. If we want to bank with the Chinese, we will. If we want to get Iranian oil out of Iran and export it throughout the world, we will do that. And that's what they're doing. And the problem with that is, is they're looking at it from how does this help our sovereignty, which you can't knock them for. But at the same time, it's helping Iran and the Ayatollahs get bankrolled, increase their nuclear weapons program. And we are seeing a resurgence of terrorism, not just in Iran, but also Al Qaeda out in Afghanistan, because again, the CCP and the Russians are out there since we left, helping them get back up and going. That country is going to implode again. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing in Ukraine is a modern day version of Afghanistan. They're gonna be out there for like 20 years. Eventually, I'm sure we're going to get on the ground there. I don't think it's a good idea, um, nor do I think we should do it. And I do think Donald Trump would come in and just hit the end button um, and say we're done with war. But these guys don't care. And so to me, Iran has always been the sort of the nexus of the road for all the bad decisions that have gone on in modern history when you look at the West versus versus them. Mm -hmm. And now you have them dictating their policies, their propaganda on the world stage at the expense of American and American allies. Who do you think started this war in Gaza and in Israel? It's the Iranian Ayatollahs funding Hamas and Gaza and Hezbollah and paying for it with money we're giving them, yes. trade they're making with the Russians and the Chinese. Or, and or, money, or, or, or money we're giving the Chinese. Exactly. And people are like, no, they're not involved. And I'm like, well, what planet are you living on? The, yeah. the Iranians, I'll do you one better or one worse, depending on how you want to look at it. The Iranian regime, I wrote an op-ed the other week, has infiltrated the highest levels of the U.S. government. Yes, you heard me correctly. Robert Malley used to be the special envoy for Iranian affairs, the highest guy we have in the land. Biden named him that. He was the top lieutenant for Obama's JCPOA. There's a history to all this. He wrote that thing, which we objected, I, I objected to, couldn't think of a worse decision, but get, we gave around you know, $16 billion in the pathway to nuclear weapons. This guy got a security clearance bounced by the FBI two months ago. Robert Malley got a security clearance removed from Chris Ray, of all people. And they haven't told us why. He's out. Robert Malley 
put in this lady by the name of Tatiana Arabai into the DOD Office of Special Operations. Why is that important? She was with him back in the day in the Biden administration uh, and the Obama stuff. And now she's in charge of our special operations policy. We have now, through great reporting from Semaphore and um, Revolver, caught her emailing the Iranian foreign ministry and asking them if it's okay to take positions that are pro-America. Wow. She still has her security clearance. She still wow. has her job. Hang on, it gets worse. The guy that's on the National Security Council right now, who is the head of intelligence programs, has gotten caught wearing pro-Palestinian garb. That's fine. That's whatever. Do, do your things. Um, in front of a sign that says, <laughs> we must be for apartheid in Israel. This guy is the head of intelligence for Joe Biden's White House. These are pro-Iranian positions that they are taking, and they are in charge of some of the most critical infrastructure nodes we have in the national security apparatus. And the media is giving them a hard pass, and we still don't know. Do you think Robert Malley got booted, and it's just because he mishandled classified information? No, there's a reason they're not telling us. There's a reason it's it involves Iran and they want to hide the ball. And this is the propaganda game that Iran's winning. We now have to print this and and put it to the American public. My, my, my question to you is, and again, yes, I, I think the Iranians are a great, great threat. My question is, how much of a threat are they really if we had America first leadership, right? Oh. I mean, you know, because to me it's like, it, th th this whole Israel deal, I mean, people can look at this this most recent conflict however they want to. All it proved to me is that the Arab world and the Muslim world isn't ready to go. They suffer a lack of technological advancement to, to fight head on with the American military in, in, in the open sky, open water, open land. They don't really want to go. I mean, Hezbollah can say what they want. Iran can say what they want. They can scream death to America, Turkey. Oh, the Tur I mean, how, how Turkey's not getting kicked out of the NATO alliance is beyond me. <laughs> I mean, the fact that Erdogan should be removed, if, I, don't, I don't even understand what the, what, the, what the partnership is here where a man can say this is East versus West, uh, Cross versus Crescent, and he's still a part of the NATO alliance is absolutely absurd to me. But this is the sort of controlled uh, opposition, controlled opposition playing out on the world stage as I see it. And I have trouble sorting through it, to be quite honest. And again, I go, if the, if the Iranians or any of these people were really going to go, why didn't they go yet? Why haven't they gone? What are they waiting on? I don't think that I don't think they believe that they can go. And again, and you tell me from an intelligence standpoint, my first thought when the whole deal went down with Hamas was, and, and the, you know, the well, we're going to do a counter strike and we're going to, you know, we're going to go door to door. We're going to get rid of Hamas in Palestine. Cool. I, I agree. Great. You should hunt them all down to the end of the earth. Tough time sorting out the Palestinians and Hamas. I mean, just on a logistical basis, even Israel would admit that. And so if you didn't have the intelligence to know that an attack like that was coming, how do you have the intelligence to then go on a counter strike that's accurate? And furthermore, how do we, if, if we don't have that type of intelligence to, to support our most dear ally in the region, to stop Hamas from loading up 5,000 front loaders and shooting them over the wall, how do we think that we can surveil Iran's nuclear advancement? I mean, these are huge, huge security questions and intelligence questions that I think your average American is just not even paying attention to. They're caught up in BLM is aligned with Palestine or or Israel is our, our national ally and we have to protect them because we're Christian and God says Israel is the Jew's land, which I'm a Christian, I, I agree with. But I'm just saying we're caught up with those things when there are real logistical intelligence questions about our, our national defense and our national interests that people aren't even asking. Does the media benefit from that lack of acumen or that lack of curiosity from the, Ameri the average American citizen now? No, it hurts America. And the only thing the media, the only person that benefits from it is Joe Biden, because it's his intentional failure of leadership that has led us there. I, I wrote another op-ed just before the Iranian infiltration went on. I think it was called something like, how did we miss World War III? How did we not see it? Mm -hmm. We didn't miss it. We weren't looking. That's not an accident. From an intelligence perspective, going back to that presidential daily briefing thing, 
there is just like anything else in life there are tiers this is a top tier this is a mid tier this is a low tier in terms of what's important you only have so much bandwidth you know you can have the greatest people in the world but you are the ones responsible directing them to look left to look right to look middle and when they should be looking in those places and how hard trump was very simple when it came to prioritizing the intelligence framework as we call it he goes al qaeda ISIS, hostages, the CCP, the cartels, the Russians, that's tier one stuff. Get after it every day with everything we have, okay? Roger that, sign that off. We put that into the bloodstream and you saw our successes about wiping out Al-Qaeda senior leadership, killing the emirs of ISIS, Baghdadi, Soleimani, mm -hmm. 54 hostages, smashing the cartels down south, putting up a border wall, crushing Chinese fentanyl. I mean, we were just on it. and. Nobody launched a war. We didn't, you know, we were looking for it, but nobody launched one. Biden comes in and the president is the one that sets that priorities, the priorities in the intelligence framework. It's called the National Intelligence Priorities Framework, the NIPIF. And they, that's their lawful duty to reorient it as they see fit. Mm -hmm. But here's the reality. Biden removed some of those top priorities because he said, and he continues to say till last week, the existential threat of our time is climate change. Okay, well, here's what happens when you take 10,000 intelligence warriors and special forces operators and you say, no, it's not Al Qaeda, it's not Iran, it's not their nuclear program, it's not the Russians, it's not the CCP. I need you to bunker down on the setting sun and the rising seas, literally. And the Department of Defense, and I'll, you don't need to believe me that this happened, under the Biden administration, the DOD, where I used to be the chief of staff, their first major concept of operations, that's what we use the terminology on how we're gonna move the building, the ship that is the DOD. The first one that they wrote for the 3 million employees of the Department of Defense was on climate change. The Department of Defense under Joe Biden's number one priority was on climate change, followed shortly by diversity, equity, and conclusion. And you, you and I can laugh about this because you got a black guy and a brown guy on this show yeah. hammering this stuff out, and they're going to come at us and say, oh, those guys are Nazis, which, you know, I can't wait to hear that. It's yeah. hilarious. Like, Donald Trump's a racist. And I'm like, look at me. I mean, you know, like, what are you guys talking about? But when you get, when you catch them in their actual racial profiling in their actual, you know, whatever they want to call it, DEI, which is just another government. Discrimination. When you catch them in discrimination. 100%. That's the word. When you catch them discriminating for people who should have the job, that just whoever's the best at it should be in charge of these positions. Right. And you put in someone else because they're brown. I'm offended. Like, no, put in the better man or woman. Right. But you ask, you know, how this happens. So when you tell the entire national security mission, don't look for Iran in their nuclear program. They march on in. And the same thing with the SDF or, or the IDF in Israel. They, they went through the same woke you know, policies that jeopardized their national security apparatus. And to go to the end of your, uh, the line of your questioning, like, okay, how do we miss it? But now, what are, what are they doing? Why aren't so basically, they- So basically, so you're saying, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that, that your assessment is we were asleep, but the attack that Hamas launched kind of woke us up, and now all the gears are back, focused on on a wartime sort of. Well, I hope so. I, yeah. I don't. You would I hope don't know, so. Because you know, Joe Biden came out again last week and said the existential threat of our time is climate change. You know, he's just not yeah. out there. So to me, that means he didn't change the collection priorities. He didn't change the national security position. Um, the, the, the azimuth is still over here on the sun instead of over here. And here's the other thing. You can't reverse engineer that kind of gapped intelligence. You can't just be like, oh, we're all in now. We're going to fix it. You missed it for two and a half years. This war happened as a result of it. And you can't govern from the bowels of the radical left-wing media headlines on national security. That's what they're trying to do. Yeah. And then the reason, when you have an enemy who's smart enough to pick up on that, but also knows the limitation of their power, like, you're like, hey, why don't they just go in there and wipe them out? What are we waiting for? What's Russia waiting for? They're winning the propaganda war, and it's costing them almost nothing. They are defeating America and Israel on the world stage. Why would they do anything more? They're going to let this bad boy ride for years. They want Joe Biden to stay in power. 
they don't want, they're not stupid. If they actually launched a nuke, it's game over. If they actually launched a missile at an American ship, it's game over. They're not going to do that. They're not dumb. They're going to, you know, drop a few grenades around an American base. They're going to put in the mainstream media, look, we're attacking the great enemy of America, and we're going to do nothing. Joe, what's Joe Biden's response? Well, is is part of it. Some people thought that the the attack from Hamas on Israel was an attempt to get us to overreact. Like you said, drop a few grenades here. I know the people of Israel certainly don't feel like the atrocity that took place was a was a was a symbol of that sort of asymmetrical strategy. But from a world standpoint, you could certainly see how now they're going to draw the West into another theater there in the Middle East that could be longstanding and have, you know, unquantifiable, you know, problems that that we don't really see yet. Um, do, do you think that that attack that day may have been more of that same strategy? Like, uh, you know, we're going to get you guys to overreact. Because, again, from and this is where, respectfully, the conservative movement, we're getting real dangerous with on a two-front war. And this is part of the danger of an asymmetry, right? It's like, well, we're here on this one, but over here we're kind of – you could just as easily make the claim that Hamas's entire intent was to make Israel look – as though they're the barbaric force yeah. on the world stage and that they're winning that war too. And even, no, if, no. even if they shouldn't be winning that war from a, from a historical standpoint or whatever, the, whatever you think about it, that is the fact. And, and, and when, you, when you corrode the, the intelligence of the average American citizen or world citizen to the point that we've allowed it to get to through our public schools, I mean, down to the grade school level, right? They don't even teach American civics anymore. I think on day one, Donald Trump should make an executive order that we're going to – can't do that because you know, everybody's got their autonomy. But yeah. we got to get some American civics back into the federal yeah. curriculums. Or I guess he could do it. You could say if we if we you don't do have – We could just give them all my new book. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, start with the Cash Patel book. Um, <laughs> so do you think that this this Israel attack was, was out of pure hatred and, and an, an actual attempt to, to take Israel or more of the same – drop a grenade, you know, yeah. uh, you know, shadow game type of uh, propaganda. Look, they've been, that, this is their singular life goal. If you are a Iranian-backed rebel, if you are Hamas, if you are Hezbollah, if you're a Shia militia group, you, the, your whole life is how do we get after Israel and by extension America? Right. Death to America. That, you know, that's... That's it. And what they did, and look, they are patient. They'll wait another 40 years if they think that's the best time to do it. They've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and they knew they're in the Trump administration. That ain't happening. Uh, and they waited, and they found the right intel gap, and they found the right time to go in at the right measure. Notice they're not you know, going over there and blowing up downtown Jerusalem. Right. That would be a step too far. Um, and they're pulling back at certain points, saying, oh, we'll give up some hostages here and there. You know, they're playing it the way they need to to extend their campaign in this war. Because as long as it's in the headlines, they're winning, America and Israel are losing. And, you know, I'll bring you an example that will probably cause a lot of controversy. Mm -hmm. There was a hospital that was blown up in Gaza. And people are like, oh, the Israelis did it. No, they didn't. The Iranians did it. They don't care about false flag operations. They don't have any rules of law or warfare. They will do whatever advances that narrative. And it's like Nord Stream 2, right? Why would you blow up your own stuff? The reason you do it is because it advances your narrative. It gives you and your people the animosity to be like, how dare you go in there and disrupt and kill innocents. We are going to go all in. Well, I want mission. I want to I want to back your point here because on my show I've been very critical of of Israel and the IDF, even though it's not popular in our conservative movement. But I've also been very unabashed about the Muslims and the Arabs and where they stand. Look, to to your point, people would look at that and go, "Well, where's the evidence that Hamas would do this? What what could you point to to suggest that Hamas would blow up their own hospital in the interest of the propaganda?" Their entire policy is that we will use civilians as a measure to deter the West or Israel from full force. I mean, they're open about that. And that, that's not really hidden. That's not conspiracy theory. And also, you could look at uh, you could look at the general policy of death to America and how open they are 
right? Because I mean, you can be critical of Israel. You can be critical of, of the competence and how they decide to do things. And are they being, uh, you know, are they going too far as well? And is it fight? There's a lot of ways to look at it. But one thing you can't ignore is when your enemies stand up on the world stage and say, death to America. Okay, hold on. As an American citizen, that should reorient you and go, well, wait a minute. Despite all of the in-between, despite the, the, the Rubicon of decisions that are made in the fog of war, we do have an enemy that openly says death to America, death to Israel. So, you know, that that's kind of where I, I start to recalibrate my own thinking and go, despite whatever criticisms you may have, these people have shown they're willing to kill America. And like the, the Iranian, uh, I think maybe it was, Maybe it was Hezbollah's uh, prime uh, leader, but it may have been the Iranian prime minister. He said, "Look, death to America is not a not a philosophy. This is policy." Whoa, you guys are looking for a fight like that? Let's let's get to it. And and you know, it's almost like they're they're egging us on. You know, and are are you worried about that if Donald yeah. Trump wins that they're going to escalate to a point where they are trying to draw us into a a more uh, a deeper level of kinetic war? at the behest of Russia and China who may be planning their own things. Are you comfortable with our with the safety there in the South China Sea to get into a further war in the Middle East? Or do you think that we could get a little more forceful in the Middle East and still protect Taiwan if that's decided to be the priority? It depends on who the commander in chief is. If Donald Trump comes in, I'm not worried about it at all. There will be no war with uh, Iran. This conflict, this war in Hamas and Gaza will end. The Ukrainian Russian thing will be over and Xi Jinping will do nothing in the South China Sea, but float a few boats near the coast of Taiwan, get the propaganda machine going. Fine, if that's what you wanna do, no problem. You know, I'll send a massive show of force with our fifth fleet carrier group out there and we'll go tit for tat on the uh, you know photography parade. Mm -hmm. We did it before. Mm -hmm. Nobody launched a missile. Nobody died. And that's the important thing. If you want to have a show of force straight off, I'm fine with that all day long as it's not an actual war. Right. 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 That's good by me. If Donald Trump's in there, the Iranians know they're they're not launching anything. They, they are going to figure out a way to blame Donald Trump for the conflict and the resolution of the conflict at the cost of the innocents in Iran and the innocent Muslims. And they're gonna spin that narrative with yeah. the Russians and the Chinese assistance on the world stage, and they will use it as fuel again to look for their next opening down the road. And they won't do that if Biden is to remain in power. This is gonna continue. If Joe Biden is reelected, these wars are not ending. They're escalating. Xi Jinping is going to do something in the South China Sea. He's going to do something with Taiwan. I don't know what exactly because the geographic outlay of Taiwan, conversation for another day, is completely different. Yes. You can't just show up on the beach and go into Taiwan. Right. It ain't as easy as everybody thinks. Yeah. So he's going to maybe do some different economic sort of stranglehold maneuvering supply chain stuff over there if Joe Biden remains in power. But if he doesn't, then we're gonna talk about the reorienting of currency manipulation. We're gonna talk about free patch in the South China Sea. We're gonna open up the Red Sea and the Strait of Hormuz and all that stuff again for oil traffic. I mean, these are these are things people never think about. But when like six tankers get banked up in the Strait of Hormuz, our gasoline prices triple. Mm. And that's what Iran's doing. Little things like that that people are just like, what are you talking for the, about? For, uh, to, be, to be clear, for you black single mothers out there, who, for some reason, the Democrat plantation, the Democrat apparatus feels feels comfortable taking their election, their rigged election statistics. I was telling a black woman this the other day in the community. I said, "Are all of you really vote ninety? Are you you really vote ninety seven percent Democrat?" Now I have questions because if I question the election results in general, then I have to question the the demographics of the results as well. And I say, "You guys don't realize when when th when this failure of foreign policy takes place, it affects you and your. Pr this is inflation. You're not going to be able." to support the two kids that you, I mean, this is, this is such a clear way for the conservative movement to, and this is why I had you on the show, to articulate how the global affects the local. And, and you know, we get caught up in some of these cultural wedge issues, and the last thing I'll, I'll ask you before we go is, do you think this failure of intelligence is, is, is partly due to a sort of woke focus with climate change, but also partly due to surveilling us, the conservatives, as the real national threat. Is, that a, is, there, is there a significant portion of the intelligence community 
significant enough that has been aimed at us as nationalists and populists and Donald Trump supporters that that would contribute to them missing vital vital information in, in, in essential places? Absolutely. We just found out that the FBI came off a child pedophilia criminal thug because he was ordered by Washington, D.C. to lift that operation out of the Midwest and go focus on January 6 targets. That guy who ended up committing more child pedophilia and got caught in a separate state and thankfully now is behind bars. One example. Two, me, the head of the Russiagate investigation during Chairman Nunes's tenureship, who exposed the FBI's corruption and they're lying to a federal court and their unlawful surveillance, et cetera. What did we just find out? That FBI under Chris Ray and that DOJ under Rod Rosenstein illegally surveilled me. We just got the records from Google that they subpoenaed all my personal information, all my banking information, my phone records, my text messages. Yeah, and do you know why we found out? Because the five-year window for notification suppression finally expired, and Google of all companies called me and said, hey, by the way, we want to let you know this. So we notified Congress. Wow. I filed a federal lawsuit against Rod Rosenstein and Chris Ray because you're right. This is your intelligence and, and law enforcement priorities. You're going after Americans who are doing their job in government because they're covering, exposing your corruption. You know what just happened two weeks ago? It was found out that 10 more staffers were surveilled during the same time. 10 more congressional senior staffers were surveilled by DOJ and FBI without a basis to do so. And they just came out and admitted it. And they just said, oh, we're changing the rules. Don't worry, nothing to see here. This is the two-tier system of justice I talk about. These are the government gangsters I talk about. Yes, I'm going to do a 30-second. Buy please. my book, please. Buy my book for the please. holiday bestseller. Anyway, Donald government Trump gangsters, it, Government Gangsters by Cash Patel. Go buy yeah. the book. Do Donald Trump called it the blueprint for 2024. It's a bestseller. But the reason, you know, he essentially was like, you got to write this book. I was like, I don't want to write a book. That's, oh, man. It's like a lot of work. Right. But he's like, you keep going on and doing media shows and people keep asking these questions like, I bet half your audience didn't even know we were illegally surveilled. I bet they don't know the intricacies of how the FBI was forced off criminal cases to go target January 6 people, America first MAGA patriots, mm -hmm. and criminals uh, were let go in middle of America because of that. So we put it all in one place, but the where it originates from is the people at the top make these decisions to weaponize government and law enforcement and intelligence. Well, what's been the heart of our conversation today, that's not an accident. And all these people, it's not a Democrat or Republican thing. That's why I keep telling folks, no, no, it's a uniparty thing. They need to defeat Donald Trump. They want to stay in power. And if they do, they get to go to the swamp. They get to have their four years in. Then they get to have their $10 million payout. Ask Esper, ask Gina Haspel, ask Rod Rosenstein and Chris Ray and the 56 other government gangsters I list in the back of the book by name and title. That's the government morass that Donald Trump blew up. And it's not an accident that they're doubling down their efforts right now to make sure he doesn't come back. Because here's the thing, the defense industrial complex, and we can talk about it next time, to me is the worst. They do the best work and the worst work out of all the lobbyist group combined. When we have a war, they have a party. When we got two wars, they're having 10 parties because they're making money. And that's why you hear people in Congress saying, yeah, we gotta, we gotta print another 150 billion. What are you talking about? Where are we getting this money? They're part of that cyclical beast that is Washington that Donald Trump just nuked. And um, they're afraid if he comes back, he's gonna finish the job a and reckoning. he's gonna end that corruption. Yeah, a reckoning. A reckoning is on the horizon from the America First Nationalist Populist <laughs> Movement. Um, the great Cash Patel, ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your time today, brother. We got to have you back on the show soon. I'll get in and, and schedule you for another hour. We know yeah. you got to run. You're a busy man. Um, we look forward to, to having you again. I thank you for stopping by today. The fight continues. Godspeed. Um, anything else? Any parting shots? Where can we follow you? Where, yeah. where can we buy the book? Obviously on Amazon or wherever else. Don't buy it from Amazon. Or Where should people buy it? No, thank you, my friend. I really appreciate this. I'm looking forward to our future conversations. Go to governmentgangsters.com, governmentgangsters.com. We're selling signed copies, memorialized copies, whatever you want in there. And yeah, it's at Walmart, Target. Yes, it's on Amazon. You can go buy it there too. But go to governmentgangsters.com. You got to ask yourself, why did Joe Biden spend 10 months blocking the release of my manuscript? It's because of the conversation we we're having today. I had to go to federal court to win the rights to release my book. And it took a year. Um, and there's only one place to follow me. I hope you and your entire army join us on Truth Social. We are kicking butt over there. I'm at Cash at KSH on Truth Social. It's the only place I post. 
And uh, I think you would have a massive fun. I finally convinced Bannon to start going full bore on Truth Social. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have some fun come the new year. We got some exciting assi- announcements. That's great. You got to get me con- uh, connected with the people over there at Truth. I- I'm, I'm willing to post over there uh, as much as possible, too. I yeah. just I remember when Truth Social first hit and, and it, there was this waiting period where you could even be on the on the side. We're all past that. Yeah, we're all past that now. I'm on the board of directors, so I'm going to sync you with my Truth Social team right today. I you're appreciate on. that. Hey, man, we appreciate you. Look forward to it. Um, give me a, We'll get a time together for you to come back. I know the audience appreciates it. Have a great day, man. We, we appreciate it. Thanks, brother. Happy Thanksgiving. Cash Patel, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the interview. I hope you found it informational, educational. We're going to try and have Cash Patel on uh, as many times as we can going into the 2024 election cycle. I don't think there's somebody better we could look to to help us understand the intelligence community the dangers therein, uh, the potential benefits, uh, what what can be done, what we should look for, what we should look to to do as as citizens making an informed vote um, at a time where uh, the nation's security, uh, the intelligence community, the, the scope of military and government is as important as it's ever been in our nation's history. So we're going to try and have cash back on as many times as we can. Uh, I thought that was an incredible conversation. I really enjoy listening to Cash Patel and talking to Cash Patel. If you want to know more about the book that Cash uh, mentioned, uh, you can go get his book online, uh, and and I, I advise you to go do so. so. We're going to put the link there in the description. As a bit of housekeeping, FreePeopleRadio.com is up and running, and our store is finally here. The store is great, in my opinion. You can buy a number of items from T-shirts to sweatshirts and hoodies and and household items and journals and all kinds of things that, that, uh, you know, express the sentiments here on Please Call Me Crazy and in the Free People Radio community. Um, So hopefully you'll you'll visit the store, freepeopleradio.store, but you can get there by visiting freepeopleradio.com and hitting the store tab in your navigation. Um, and I hope you enjoy it and uh, look for more, more, uh, more merchandise to come, more, more items to come that are fun, that, that, uh, help symbolize, you could say, symbolize what we're doing here on the podcast. Uh, we're still waiting on those, uh, spit on the floor t-shirts. I, I really wanted those ones to be special. I know a lot of you are waiting on those, but the Godspeed t-shirts are my, my personal favorite. Uh, but the Cuckslayer sweatshirts, uh, are a close second. So. A lot of fun stuff there on the store, freepeopleradio.com. You can also find out where to follow and listen to the podcast. Again, I hope you enjoyed Cash Patel, and I hope you all have a very, very happy Thanksgiving tomorrow. Um, Enjoy it. Spend time with your families. Eat well. Bless the food. uh, Be thankful. Nothing more important in today's culture, in today's society, than to remember the importance and the value of gratitude not only to your family members and, and your loved ones in your community, um, your children, your parents, so on and so forth, but also God, right? And, and your gratitude to God for, for the miracle of even being alive. Um, that's it for me. I hope you all uh, have a happy Thanksgiving, and I'll see you on Friday. The fight continues. As always, Godspeed.